So it's just like the rest of, you know, if you want six pack abs for summertime, you know, we're going to be exercising, we do nutrition and intermittent, intermittent fasting and make sure we're sleeping and stuff. So we have to do the same with our brains because really a healthy brain leads to a healthy body, which then leads to a healthy life. So that's kind of, that's kind of where, where we are with, with brain health is that we want to kind of get that brain on the train with the rest of the body so that people understand that it's actually you know, all part and parcel of the same thing. Dr. Andy Wong, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine Podcast. I am so excited to have you on today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carrie, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be on here. Well, you and I have been talking for years. We've known each other for years and gone back and forth and we've done social media things together and other podcasts. So I'm really glad to to have you on mine, on my platform finally, because I just love what you do on yours. I'm so excited to be on today and love listening to your podcast too. <laughs> well, so every we're talking about brain health, but not everyone quite yet knows who you are. So why don't you give a brief introduction of who you are and what you do, what you stand for, and we'll jump into all the brain health questions. Great. So hopefully people will understand this, but I am not a neurologist. I'm not a brain health doctor. I am a board certified internal medicine doctor and is fellowship trained in integrative medicine and also trained in functional medicine. So you know, I wanted to talk about functional medicine because this is the Root Cause Medicine podcast, and I'm really a root cause medicine doctor. I'm happy to be on this podcast. Uh, functional medicine, as, as you know, and your listeners may know too, is that even though we look at patient symptoms, we also really want to look with patients to get to the root cause or plural causes as, you know, what's actually causing the symptoms they might feel. So in order to do that, we actually have to physiologically we connect the dots. So I would say I'm a specialist in connect the dots medicine. And, um, you know, I did uh, co-found a clinic, Capital Integrator Health in the Washington, D.C. area in 2015. So it's been open about eight years. But really, our passion is to get to the root cause of health conditions. And I started getting to functional neurology a bit by accident, because when my friends asked me to lecture at, at Georgetown on functional neurology as, as a sub for, for him, you know, because he couldn't do it. So thank you, Dr. Kogan. <laughs> um, and just doing research, you know, a ton of research on these presentations and year after year, you know, um, presenting there and then uh, writing a recent article with Dr. Hagenorn, uh, who's a neurofeedback specialist, just seeing a lot of patients with neurologic conditions, but then also generally speaking as an internal medicine and integrated primary care doctor, seeing how much improving brain health can improve general health. Mm -hmm. So I really am um, starting to focus a bit more, even though I'm a generalist on, on brain health. And uh, we do see that even with people with, which we'll talk about later in this podcast, but, you know, people with uh, sort of traditionally, you know, sort of irreversible conditions like Alzheimer's, you know, like for instance, I, I would drive by a couple of years ago and, you know, you'd, you'd see these nursing home signs, right? And they would say stuff like Alzheimer's care, it's all we do. And, you know, people go there, but it's a one-way ticket. People don't go back, come back, you know? Right, right. And so now we're starting to see with, as we'll, we'll see, you know, talk about Dr. Dale Bredesen and some of the research that him and others have done. And we see that actually cognitive decline with Alzheimer's can be reversible. I mean, not in every case, but it's so interesting when you use that root cause approach that it actually, physiology can change, you know, even at that time. Yeah, and brain health is such a fascinating topic. And to a lot of people, like when I talk about this with, non-medical professionals, my family, et cetera, you know, they look at me like I'm crazy, like brain health. What do I care? You know, I don't have Alzheimer's. I'm like, oh no, no, no. It starts long before that. So can you explain to everybody, what do we mean when you talk brain health with your patients? Like what are the symptoms that are maybe indicating, Hey, I think there's dysfunction going on up in the brain. So I'm going to start out with a little joke because um, we all talk about exercise. First of all, exercise is one of the best things you can do for your brain. So we'll talk about that, but Remember how everyone used to say no, no pain, no gain? Yeah. Well, there's also no brain, no gain, right? If we don't have a brain, we can, we can treat the gut. We can balance hormones, which I know you're an expert in. And I love trying to balance hormones as well. Look at the immune system during COVID and everything. Look at the structural system, you know, reduce pain. But if we don't have a brain, none of that matters. And so really, in a way, the brain is intimately tied into who we are physically, mentally, emotionally spiritually it contains our life stories or experiences it also mediates our emotions both joy and sadness feelings and thoughts and it really i think a lot of people are wondering you know listening to this podcast and and like you said your neighbors what why do we care about the brain well number one if we have a healthy brain it also help, helps us cultivate meaningful relationships 
you know, um, with ourselves and others. So we live and experience our whole lives with the brains. And when you look at it from a root cause medicine perspective, the brain is the organ that really helps to influence all the others, just like they influence the brain as well, but really no brain, no game. So that's, that's one I thing. love that. I love that. The other thing, and, and, you know, looking at brain health is that we have to actually zoom backwards. We're on Zoom here. So we can zoom backwards to the 17th century to Rene Descartes. Because, you know, Rene Descartes, as you know, is a very famous uh, scientist. And he basically said the body is not connected to the brain. Mm -hmm. And here we are in the 21st century. And we're actually still, even though we think we're in 2022, we're actually living in the 17th century because we have neurologists and we have cardiologists and we have endocrinologists, right? But it's not all connected. But even in functional medicine, sometimes when we see, you know, we talk about physiology and we, we don't, we almost, even with that, we still have that bias towards the uh, Cartesian model of brain body separation. And I'm kind of here to tell, you, tell your listeners that really physical health and mental health are the same, you know, that the thoughts and the emotions that we have have physical uh, manifestations and consequences. And like, and just like that, you can, you can also change the, the mindset and change sort of the brain patterns and neuroplasticity and then change the rest of the body's physical health because it's all connected. Right. So we started in our clinic, you know, eight years ago, um, sort of not really calling it mind body connection anymore, but it's really like body mind or, you know, body mind equivalency or, you know, something like that. Cause even that word connection means that there's two pieces, two Lego pieces that are disconnected and we're going to join them together and we're going to just mash them together and we're going to just call them connected, but they're really the same, right? We can't like, if we had a, if we had a, didn't have a brain, we wouldn't really have a body. We we just have a corpse and then we just be in Shavasana all the time, which I love that pose, by the way, that's a great <laughs> pose. So for anyone that loves yoga, that, that is the best pose. But um, that being said, you know, I think what we really want to say about brain health is, you know, optimal brain health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Um, and how do we achieve that? How do we kind of gain that? We, we want to continuously develop and exercise our brains. Mm -hmm. So it's just like the rest of, you know, if we want six pack abs for summertime, you know, we're going to be exercising, we do nutrition and intermittent, intermittent fasting and make sure we're sleeping and stuff. So we have to do the same with our brains because really a healthy brain leads to a healthy body, which then leads to a healthy life. So that's kind of, that's kind of where, where we are with, with brain health is that we want to kind of get that brain on the train with the rest of the body so that people understand that it's actually you know, all part and parcel of the same thing. And I don't think people realize that at all. I think you're, a, I, I mean, I know you're hundred percent right. We, we separate the brain neurology, just like we separate the mouth, you know, dentistry, like the mouth is not part of the body. The brain is not part of the body. And so when, when medications have been developed for things like dementia or Alzheimer's, it's very brain focused when in fact, so much systemic, the rest of the body, what's happening in the rest of the body can lead to brain symptoms, correct? I mean, yes, exactly, Carrie. And in fact, in my opinion, really what needs to happen from a pharmacology perspective, if we're going to look at root causes of brain health, you probably need to look at the gut as the mm -hmm. area to develop pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals and, you know, all the different lifestyle factors, because we know that a lot of brain pathology actually starts in the gut and kind of travels up the vagus nerve and things like that. So we can talk about that. But yeah, I would say that that whole myopic view of brain health, let's just treat the brain, but knowing that the brain's connected to the rest of the body now, we can kind of see that opening that window to therapeutics. We need to treat the entire body to treat the brain effectively and optimally. And I'm seeing more in the literature, the idea behind an inflamed brain. You know, I see it um, even in the scientists and researchers and educators on social media talking about inflamed brain where the majority of that inflammation, of course, comes from the book or from the gut. But can you talk about that? Like, what does it mean, brain on fire, or to have an inflamed brain? And and what what are people dealing with when you see that in your clinic? Yes. Yeah, so the inflamed brain, we basically talk on a molecular level about you know the brain on fire, which is just exactly what you said. You know, just yeah. imagine a brain and you light some kerosene, <laughs> but it's not exactly <laughs> like that. But um, neuroinflammation, or basically inflammation of the nervous system, but so both the brain and the nervous system, is defined really as an inflammatory brain within either the brain itself or the spinal cord that kind of 
you know, goes down from the brain, like a little ladder, you know, that communicates to the rest of the body. So really that spinal cord is that nervous system's ability uh, or rather mechanism for um, communication between the brain and the rest of the body. So this inflammation uh, of the brain or the nervous system in general is actually mediated by these innate immune cells of the brain called microglia. So these micro microglia are some of these supportive cells. And, and then typically just to, just to kind of give your listeners a sense, there's usually one uh, major brain cell, like a neuron to every 10 glial cells. So there might be like, think of a, uh, uh, Broadway, you know, since East Coast here, right? New York City, Broadway, and you have the lead, you know, singer belting out Annie or whatever. And then you have 10 people behind, you know, her, or him, like singing and dancing, right? That's kind of what's happening is these glial cells are really wanting to protect the um, neurons, these main neurons, but they can also be inflamed and they can, they can actually start to, you know, damage the neuron uh, with the inflammation if, if they get kind of out of control. So that's what you think about when you think about brain inflammation or uh, inflamed brain. Um, there's a lot of things that trigger um, uh, there, that, that trigger uh, brain inflammation. So I, I think we should just go through a little bit of a, of a overview of a forest yeah. view. So what I would typically say, so, you know, what are things that set the brain on fire? Well, um, we mentioned kerosene, but I think we should actually start first with something really basic, which is alcohol, mm, right? Because actually, yes. you know, um, <laughs> yeah. In, in fact, yeah. So alcohol, you know, I actually went to college where, uh, which I didn't directly participate in this, but um, definitely uh, people were setting these little benches on fire, these wooden benches, you know. So you think about people running around the fire and, and you know, putting alcohol, you know, over there and things like that. So. Alcohol is actually very inflammatory to the brain, and it is something that uh, will inflame the brain, even if you drink, you know, four drinks, five drinks at a time, or one drink, so uh, at a time. So, so this is actually something that will disrupt what's called the blood-brain barrier. It will increase glial cell inflammation. It will increase these different chemical messengers, like what's called NF-kappa-beta. So basically, alcohol is something that you really don't want to um, partake too much of. Of course, there's certain times that you might want to do it for social reasons, but certainly wouldn't be for brain health reasons. I think that's something that we always talk about alcohol and how it might be so good for our vascular system. We should just drink another glass of that red wine. Um, we should just uh, probably eat the skins of red grapes or something like that instead of the alcohol, if anything. And so that's that's my view on that. Um, there's also just for your listeners to um, a recent study in the unit from the United Kingdom that showed that even two drinks a week, right? So that's less than one a day. Two drinks a week was associated with an increase of cognitive decline. Mm. So kind of bad news for you know everyone likes to drink one drink a, a day, which was considered in my time in school moderate drinking, right? So if moderate drinking is something that's causing cognitive decline, then I don't really want to be a moderate drinker, actually. Right. Right. Um, and then other things that we might think of are, you know, other big things, and then we'll get into the things that maybe people don't know as much about is uh, dysregulated blood sugar. So if someone has a super high blood sugar or a super low blood sugar, or if that blood sugar is average, but the mean is, you know, okay, meaning the average, but it kind of fluctuates around that mean quite a bit. So this dysregulation, almost like a yo-yo or a roller coaster kind of blood sugar, then that's not really good for the brain. The brain doesn't like that kind of, um, kind of reminds me of these uh, adult happy meals. You know, they just have this adult happiness from McDonald's. Well, that's, that might be happy uh, for, for, you know, getting those characters, but that's not really happy for your brain. You know, so, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that can actually spike blood sugar. It's actually very hard to regulate blood sugar if you eat a standard, you know, kind of ultra processed modern uh, diet. So, uh, so we have to be a bit um, judicious on that. Um, we could also look at specific things. I think the biggest culprit in sort of modern uh, day nutrition is probably the vegetable seed oils, the things like um, canola or sunflower, safflower oils, things like that, which are going to be found at most restaurants. So I actually called a bunch of restaurants in our area, Carrie, and I tried to like ask them and tried to like convince them to switch to olive oil thing for things. They're like, no, nah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But, but these are things that aren't advertised on their menus, right? Because it's kind of like, oh, well, I have this organic food, but I'm going to fry it in, you know, vegetable seed oil. So that's not going to be, that's going to negate that. Um, so we have uh, toxins like alcohol, also pesticides, mycotoxins, 
which I know you've had guests on here before, dysregulated blood sugar, inflammatory diet, including vegetable seed oils, ultra processed foods, hypoxia, which is low oxygen. Yeah. So obviously the brain needs oxygen. Um, the brain is not getting enough oxygen through either things like sleep apnea or just trouble with um, nasal passages, you know, sinus issues, chronic sinusitis, but then also I think shallow breathing, you know, how many people nowadays are stressed out are not breathing deeply and not getting enough oxygen. Um, gut inflammation, that's a big one. There's actually a big gut brain connection. So brain inflammation, we automatically in our clinic think about how the gut might be inflamed and actually that leaky gut and you know, things like a leaky gut, gut infections, food allergens, or food sensitivities can actually lead to a systemic inflammation, which can then lead to brain inflammation that way. Um, and then interestingly, um, any physical or psychological stress. So physical stress is a bit more intuitive, like if someone got into an accident or have chronic pain or something like that, then that's going to increase some of the mediators that will modulate the stress response, the HPA axis, or hypothalamic um, pituitary adrenal axis, but then psychological stress will also do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they will increase um, what, again, is the mediator of chronic inflammation, which is this molecule called NF-kappa beta, and also lead to uncontrolled cortisol, which is an adrenal hormone that modulates both acute and chronic stress, as you all know. So I think what people may realize a bit more, or starting to realize more, is that really physical or psychological stress can do the same thing they can both be super damaging to the brain. Um, one thing that we should mention too, is that you know when people are stressed out, they don't remember as much. And that's yeah. because we're gonna have high cortisol. It's gonna dampen the hippocampus um, function in terms of memory. So people are like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm so stressed. I can't remember I, you know, where my keys are. Well, that's part of the issue. They need to take a deep breath, then they can find their keys, yeah. It's amazing how, um, you know, like I said in the beginning with brain health, people automatically go to dementia, Alzheimer's, but yet they don't realize, um, as you would say, you know, anxiety or depression or, or, or just even brain fog memory, you know, just these, the day-to-day -day memory, it doesn't have to be dementia can be affected by something as little as, well, I had, a, I had, you know, I love my glass of wine every night and, um, I, I, um, snack all day long. So my blood sugar is, is, is really pretty dysregulated and, um, I'm not sleeping that great. And when I do sleep, I've been told that I snore or have mild sleep apnea, but I don't really want to do anything about it. And so it just compounds, right? They've got blood sugar issues, toxin issues, lack of oxygen issues. And maybe in the short term, maybe for like a weekend, a wedding, you know, like a wedding away, you drink, you eat crap, you don't sleep that great. You're out late, but then you can recover. But how many people, how many people in your practice um, this is their norm. This is their every day. This is their every week. And then it just compounds as we get older and all of a sudden they're falling apart. Yeah, exactly. I have two points to make to that. Really, really great. Thank you for the segue. Um, so <laughs> number one is that Alzheimer's starts decades before. In fact, most of your listeners here probably don't have Alzheimer's, right? And they're wondering how does this relate to me? But you know, it's really the things that, like you said, Carrie, that we do day in and day out. Yeah, we're going to have that wedding or that one off or things, you know, night out with friends, and that's fine. But if this is happening every single night, even in little tiny amounts, like I'm just going to have another drink. It's okay. I'm just going to skip my sleep because I have some work to do or something like that. You know, we've all been there. You know, I've been there. So it's, you know, something we all, we're all working on it as people, you know. Um, but it is kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. You can have the camel there and you can pile on a little bit, but you know, the camel's pretty, it's a double hump camel. You know, your brain's a double hump camel, actually. It can take a lot, it can hold a lot. It can hold a lot of stuff, a lot of crap, right? And so it's really not the root cause, it's the root causes of all these different lifestyle things that are happening. It's all these things that we pile up on this double hump camel and eventually the back will break, but it might break you know, later on, 30, 40 years later, just, you don't see it right now. Yeah. Um, you might see it actually in tiny amounts, like if someone's having a little bit more brain fog or a little bit like, I can't remember my keys are, or I can't, I wasn't as fast on, you know, um, sort of these executive decisions I have to make, like, um, you know, like, you know, how do I cross the 
tree and, I, and that's probably not a good example but um maybe i have some really complex decisions to make at, at work or at home and and i'm just a little bit slower like you can still do it but it's a little so so these are the warning signs and your brain's trying to tend to tell you as a friend hey you know what camel back is screening a little it's time to lay off that third drink of alcohol, you know, or that, you know, fifth donut, because even though it's like buy seven, get five free, you know, it's yep. not totally free for your brain. So we're going to pay for it later, right? Yeah. It's a matter of when. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's what I would say about about brain health is that it's not it's not as immediately sexy, like we're going to give someone some testosterone and estrogen, they're going to feel great, or, you know, we're going to do a 30 day whole 30 or something like that. And then we're going to have six packs and look good at the beach. So it's not really an instant gratification here, but it's more of a long term investment in in your health and your loved one's health. And I always talk about that because in my personal life, um, and I've shared this before on the podcast, my family tends to live a really long time. I, longevity runs in my family, my grandparents were alive until their late 80s and 90s. My great grandparents were alive until their 90s. I knew some of my great grandparents, which I know a lot of people aren't that lucky. So I know my lifespan, short of God forbid getting hit by a bus or something, is going to be long. And I want my health span to be just as, as good. Right? I want my brain to be relatively sharp, as sharp as it can be, up into my 80s and 90s and subsequently I want the rest of my body to follow suit I want to be active and mobile and and strong and and not be reliant on a wheelchair or or something like that and so by taking care of my brain health now I often get asked you know why why are you so disciplined like why do you care why why are you such a pain to go out to eat with I'm like because now I'm in my 40s and so being as a female in her 40s I know I'm transitioning in perimenopause which affects the brain. And then I know like my lifespan is going to be long. So I need to start. I've started a long time ago to protect my brain. I don't want to get to the point where I have to make a list for everything, where I have forgotten things, where my mood starts to go, where my memory really starts to slip. Um, my personality starts to change. I don't, I don't want to do that. And so that's I think why that's I have... a big motivating factor, yeah. honestly. Yeah, because yeah. people do realize that even though they won't necessarily get that clear benefit 30 days into this, like, you know, affecting the brain, they're going to get that huge payoff at the end, you yeah. know, to help with the lifespan or certainly health span. I have a I have an interesting story, too, to share is um, my my grandmother, one of my uh, my uh, sorry, my great grandmother um, immigrated here at age 60. And so she, upon entering this country, uh, developed diabetes. In Ooh. other words, she didn't have it before at age 60. Um, so then she went back to eating this traditional diet of like fish and veggies and stuff and um, started taking care of, you know, grandkids and great grandkids. And I think that honestly kept her young, but, you know, she lived till her, you know, upper 90s as well. And, you know, I think it is something where, yeah, I'd like to be like her, you know, mm -hmm. be nice too. I don't know how long I'm going to live, who knows, but <laughs> at least, you know, there's some chance, right? If there's some chance, I'm going to do everything I can to, to try to optimize that so I can, I can be there with my, for my family and everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And see, that's why I have experts like you on, because I, I, I say it and sometimes people are like, yeah, uh-huh. But when I, more people that I have on talking about brain health and we can raise the awareness. I mean, especially recently that study came out um around serotonin right and it's, yes. it's not necessarily the lack of serotonin being the root cause of mood disorders like depression and depression of course is a very 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 common symptom that a lot of people struggle with um and that ssris or uh, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors may not be the gold that they thought it was and so now we know maybe that brain on fire brain inflammation the things you're, you've mentioned are actually the root cause of depression can you talk about that yes and um i would say depression is something that we see so much in, in integrated primary care you know a lot mm -hmm. of what we do is mental health because as as we said at the beginning of this physical health and mental health aren't even just tied together they're really the same thing if someone has you know depression they might have fatigue or they might have you know body aches and and who knows what's causing what essentially so from a functional perspective Depression is really quite simply brain inflammation. I mean, if someone has depression, they their brain is on fire, you know, from a molecular level. So, you know, it, to me, the true cause of root cause of depression is unchecked chronic brain inflammation. Now, what happens is that chronic inflammation does actually 
um, reduce the synthesis of different neurotransmitters. And I think serotonin is not, you know, serotonin deficiency is not the cause of depression, but probably inflammation is actually causing some of the neurotransmitter deficiencies. We actually know that, you know, over 90% of serotonin is made in the gut, you know, 50% of dopamine is made in the gut. So these are some of these happy or, you know, focused type of mood chemicals that, that we make, but these neurotransmitters should really be called gut transmitters, right? They're actually really <laughs> mostly true. made in the gut and, you know, maybe a little bit's made in the, in the brain, but it's kind of like, you know, we're in ele an election year. So it's kind of like the, the results are already in, but it's like, oh, that 1% of that pre precinct, we still got to wait for that. But yeah, I mean, there's still going to be a big, uh, you know, the gut's really your neurotransmitter powerhouse, even though, even though it's not the brain, the gut has neurons as well. And the gut, you know, certainly does make uh, serotonin and dopamine. But aside from that, I would just say that the depression is also an energy issue. If you think about depressed individuals, they're slow, they're lethargic, they're sitting on the couch watching Netflix. I like watching Netflix as well. So that's not a, a you know, dog against Netflix, but they lack energy and motivation to go out. They might not want to go out and dance, or they might not want to go out with their friends. And, you know, they might want to go drinking. <laughs> not that we are talking about drinking all the time. Um, but there's so many things that can cause a depletion of energy that really, you know, we have to think about sort of root causes of why someone might be having that energy issue. But if the brain has, has, uh, doesn't have enough fuel, essentially enough adenosine triphosphate or ATP through a variety of mechanisms like hormone imbalance would be certainly be one that can cause mood issues, gut dysfunction, general inflammation, which think then can cause brain inflammation that then increases that NF kappa beta and causes depression. Then what happens is the cell's energy powerhouses, which are called the mitochondria, these batteries inside the cell that produce ATP are affected. And the, the body essentially doesn't produce enough uh, ATP or energy and then depression results. You know, we've even had some people in our clinic where, you know, we started them on on sort of traditional nutraceutical anti-inflammatories, things like turmeric mm -hmm. uh, or curcumin, I would say. And, and, you know, lo and behold, not that this is a magic bullet for everyone. So I don't want people to go away with that saying everyone on curcumin now. Um, but, you know, they came back a month later and they were like, you know what, I'm not depressed. Or we put people on omega-3 fatty acids to have them eat more fish. These are all big, powerful anti-inflammatories and they're not depressed anymore. So did we give them serotonin? No, you know. And, and, you know, in a way, what happened is that inflammation went down enough so the batteries were able to recharge and reduce and then produce that ATP. So they felt better. Mm -hmm. They felt enough energy to make neurotransmitters to just basically not even just neurotransmitters, but just function um, adequately. So a healthy brain is going to result in a healthy mood. So the way I would approach depression or anxiety really um, is really to build up the brain, is really to support the brain and, and optimize that brain health. And is there a way to test the brain? Like, do you, that's that you do in your clinic? Um, or do you like the idea of brain scans? You know, there's different clinics out there that look at various kinds of brain scans. How do you do it? At Capital well, Carrie, Carrie, you have worked with us for a number of years. So, you know, we love, <laughs> I know, testing. we love testing. And yeah, so, so first of all, let's talk about specific brain tests, and then we'll go into more general tests that are going to be supportive because we also need to look at the general system to support the brain, since they're really connected, as you're saying in the beginning. So I think that um, functional testing can help to differentiate between what's called subjective cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. which is when you feel like you're losing your mind, but no one else feels like you're losing your mind. And the scan also doesn't tell you that you're losing your mind. In other words, you have a normal scan. So when we're talking about scans, we can do things like um, functional MRIs or, or even CT scans. I particularly like something called an MRI with neuroquants, which is a volumetric analysis that looks at various brain, uh, brain areas, most notably because we're usually worried about things like mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's, which in, con which in contrast to subjective cognitive impairment, is when you either feel like you're losing your mind and other people also agree, which mm. is subjective, uh, which is, sorry, which is a mild cognitive impairment or in Alzheimer's, you don't know that you're losing your mind because you're probably too far gone, but then everyone else is like, hey, hey, you need help here, right? That's more like Alzheimer's. So in both of SCI and um, subjective cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's, you do see changes often in these scans. You see a loss of, um, hippocampal volume. So the hippocampus is the main, uh, one of the main brain areas that is involved with memory. And you see other different lobes of, of the brain 
um, that that might be shrinking. You see the ventricles, which are the the spaces in the brain get larger. Think of the Homer Simpson brain, right? Yeah. <laughs> the one yeah. With, even the donut with a huge large ventricle. Like, yeah, there's nothing in that brain anymore. Yeah. So, so. I shouldn't laugh, but Homer Simpson, I had to laugh. Yeah, so Homer Simpson. So, um, so it is, it is funny, but it's not funny because we know that, you know, this is someone's brain we're talking about. But the good news is that we do see, and Dr. Bredesen has proven in his studies, published studies, research that, that really brain volume can be regenerated even at a, at a moderate stage. I think he definitely showed in mild to moderate dementia, you can even see that, you know, people going from a, a, a one or two percentile of hippocampal line, which is really, terrible, right? It's really not, not very good, you know, all the way up to, you know, 40, 50% or something really amazing that you wouldn't be able to see like over 10 years ago. So, um, so there is imaging like that. Um, we do use online neurocognitive testing as well to um, really look at someone's um, overall, what's called a neurocog index. And then you use a percentile kind of a graph to measure that against other people that are of the same age and gender. So there's, there's that kind of piece. Um, we also do look at uh, lab testing. So if someone is having uh, brain health issues, let's say cognitive impairment or memory issues or expecting to have Alzheimer's, then often we'll do um, some of the vibrant testing, which I know that you might be familiar with there. Um, th things like neurologic autoantibodies that can really help differentiate between you know possible Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. And this is about brain health. So it's not just about Alzheimer's. So I will say we've had some patients, for instance, that thought they had multiple sclerosis and they had numbness and tangling and weakness in all these areas, but have been to neurologists for 20 years, did the lumbar puncture, you know, did, did um, regular brain MRIs and, and none of that showed it, but, you know, it, it looked like multiple sclerosis, smelled like multiple sclerosis, and sometimes it takes these really it takes these really good blood molecular tests like the vibrant test to actually uh, suggest that diagnosis. Then we sent them back to neurology, and lo and behold, she had MS. So th this is the kind of thing that can really move the needle for some of these difficult cases. Um, we also do, of course, look at a genetic test called um, apo apolipoprotein E, and there's a specific uh, variation of that gene called APOE4, which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. And basically this genetic variation does predispose people to have more inflammation, including more brain inflammation. So um, the one thing we should say about genetics, which I know you probably talked about before, is that your genes are not your destiny, right? Everyone's like, oh, had a person, you know, um, family member with Alzheimer's or had a family member with diabetes, I'm going to get that. So I'm just going to eat that adult happy meal because it doesn't matter. But it does. It does matter because the genes have different switches and your lifestyle and your nutrition and stress and things like that can switch these, um, basically these little um, histones, these little uh, marks on the, the genome on and off. And that can actually turn on or off those genes. So you can actually have an APOE4 gene, mm -hmm. and, and that might predispose someone to more inflammation. But if you live your life in a way that that gene doesn't really get uh, activated as much, then you can have a much better chance of reducing uh, your risk of developing Alzheimer's down the line. So I think that's really important to know yeah. is that um, these things can be modified. Yeah. Yeah. What about like blood sugar, insulin, um, stool studies? Um, so we like A1C 5.3 or below. So hemoglobin A1C is about a three, four month, let's say three month uh, test of, of blood sugar over time. We look at fasting blood sugar. Ideally, we like that 85 or below okay. because above that, you're starting to get into uh, the pancreas is, is secreting too much insulin at baseline. So you want to, you know, a, a, another thing which, you know, I think is really important to know from a functional interpretation of things is that we, we kind of look at the conventional range that comes to us through lab quest and then we kind of ignore it. So, so we, <laughs> yeah. and that's not trying to not be disrespectful here, but we, we take it and, and we take it at face value, but we have to take it with a grain of salt. In fact, maybe a whole lump, a lump of salt in there um, because we have to figure out what is conventionally acceptable and then we have to figure out what's optimal. Right. So we will look at uh, insulin as well. And typically, you know, it depends on the person, you know, ideally uh, we want that insulin below five. Um, but if someone's insulin is at 24, I'm not going to try to have them go down from a 24 to a five. I might say, let's go down from double digits to single digits. Let's try that over the next year. And then ultimately over time, that person's hopefully pancreas um, and body gets more insulin sensitive and, and 
you know, they, they, their basal insulin level goes down and stuff like that. So we definitely do look at, at metabolic markers, um, uric acid as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what we see is that really cardiometabolic disease is, is the most common cause of, of dementia or of brain inflammation, I would say. You know, mm -hmm. we know that in the U.S. anyway, you know, 88% at least, um, of, according to that North Carolina study, of people have metabolic syndrome. And when I was doing some research from different talks on that, I realized that even that's probably underestimating it because it's not looking at all the people with skinny fat, yeah. right? So if everyone yeah. had like an end body, which is a body composition analysis, I bet it would be like 95%, you know? Uh, but anyway, I think that we're just all eating too much sugar and, uh, and you know, things that inflame our brains for whatever reason. Uh-oh, I think you just froze. Are you back? I, I did freeze. I'm sorry. Um, tell me where I should start again. Uh, I'm, I'm here. Are you here? I can hear you. Your picture is still frozen. Let me go on to the, let me go into another area or okay. I go closer to the Wi-Fi. It, it, tell oh, me if you can you're hear back. Me. You're back. I can see you walking. So I'm I'm in a I'm in an <laughs> alcove. Uh, so I'm in an alcove. So I'm gonna switch. Hopefully that's not that's gonna mess up the podcast. No, it'll be fine. Okay. All right. Now this is totally uh now now there's a picture of a, a tidal <laughs> wave uh, behind behind me, but <laughs> that's okay. It'll work out. Um all right, so I'm I heard you were you were the sentence you said was basically um uh, we eat too much sugar um and then you you kind of like cut out and then you froze so if you okay, want so i'm going to start that and i'm actually going to yeah. improv here now that i have a picture of a tsunami behind me um <laughs> so so we do eat too much sugar and we actually know that there's an epidemic there's actually a tidal wave of metabolic disease that that's coming for us if we don't you know watch out for it it's going to cause a lot of heart disease vascular disease but also brain disease, including dementia. So you can see like this picture behind me here. This, <laughs> Love it, now that you're there. Um, yes, now that I'm here. Um, and so I would say that uh, we do check a bunch of other tests like hormone tests. We're gonna look at sex hormones, adrenal hormones. We know that DHEA is very protective for the brain. We know that estradiol, testosterone as well, progesterone. So. Um, you know better than I do on that. Um, APOE, I don't always check APOE, but if I do, I'm going to always give that caveat that it's about the epigenetics, not the genetics. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll check sometimes vibrant uh, or other micronutrient tests. So we know there's a lot of different uh, micronutrients that your body needs to survive and thrive and your brain needs to survive and thrive. So things like choline, things like some of the B vitamins that are involved in methylation, um, especially, uh, vitamin, like, uh, I'd say riboflavin, niacin, uh, vitamin B6, which is pyridoxine folate, and then cobalamin, which is B12. And then there's also a really nice uh, test that's available in a lot of places called Omega check. So that's looking at basically the content in the red blood cell membrane of different omega-3 fatty acids. And they'll usually check the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. Mm -hmm. So basically what you want to know about that is you want to have a fairly, you know, low ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, typically, I think, ideally four to one or less. But the idea is your omega-3s are going to actually be protective as an anti-inflammatory against brain disease. And I, a recent study just came out over the, the last, you know, a couple of days here that showed that people that take uh, omega-3 and supplements or food sources do, do have brain protection, actually. When they when they start taking it in middle age, which yeah. is kind of nice. That's really so, nice. So there's still hope. Uh, there's still hope for us, Carrie. <laughs> I think we're still young, right? I used to yeah. say to people, "Yeah, we're in our yeah, we're we're, you know, we're 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 young, yeah. yeah, young at heart for sure. Young at heart, yeah. Well, that's what matters. That's <laughs> Taking what matters. care of ourselves. The the other thing is that glutathione is the most important antioxidant in the in the body and brain. And you know, if we do get to, hopefully, we both do get, you know to, you know, over age 85, at that point, everyone's glutathione levels drop. So we want to at least support cysteine, which is the rate limiting amino acid that makes up glutathione, um, right, uh, a a along with along with the other two. But we do think about, you know, things like cruciferous vegetables to help support cysteine, or we can do supplements like NAC or glutathione. But the idea is that we do want that glutathione level to be high 
even in even in like older age when we're young at heart but we're starting to get <laughs> chronologically older you know um that is something that we're going to want to really um you know optimize i think as well and this what i love this is what i love i love that so for you know you're listening to this you are board certified came from the conventional allopathic you're an integrative functional doctor with a very busy thriving practice and you're like this is what we do for brain health this is how we work it up this is how we view it this is the lens there's a lot you can do so if somebody's listening to this thinking oh my my doctor would never or if i ask my doctor i know they would say there's no tests out there when in fact there are it's an incredibly proactive there's a lot of proactive things you can do to protect your brain everything from brain fog anxiety depression all the way up to hopefully cross fingers, preventing or reducing the risk of dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Absolutely. There is so much you can do to um, prevent or mitigate or reduce your risk of, of brain health issues, whether it's dementia or whether it's anxiety or depression. I mean, who yeah. wants to live their life with uncontrolled anxiety, or depression? That's no yeah. fun. Yeah. But also who wants to be on, and, and, and I will just have a caveat here. I think for some light medications are life-saving, totally. but for others, they can definitely cause biological what are called side effects or basically you know untoward effects that you know make that make that person um you know not be optimal in terms of their health so we we do want to kind of have a balanced view of that but certainly there's many many things um naturally integratively um lifestyle wise that can be done for brain health and i think the thing i love about brain health and how why i'm so interested in it's because you really have to use all the tools in the toolkit to optimize the brain. It's not just about the brain, but it's about the gut, the hormones, yeah. the immune system, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Um, it's it's honestly, and we didn't mention this, but you know, I have some buddies that uh, I'm, I'm kind of getting more into this is, you know, high intensity exercise and strength training and, you know, things like that, that's gonna really help what's called brain derived neurotrophic factor. Yeah. So, so you know, this basically fertilizer for the brain, this um, protein called brain derived neurotrophic factor is increased with exercise. It's increased with mindfulness, meditation, things like that. Um, but it's also increased with, uh, with different other things that you can do really easily, like omega-3 fatty acids, which you can get from fish or from walnuts or other plant sources of omega-3. So there's a lot of things you can do that you can do day in, day in and out to day in, day in and day out rather to take some of that load off that double hemp camel that, um, that you that's been working so hard for you all these years well if we were to funnel it all down given that this is the root cause medicine podcast i am all about practical and tactical we've been talking about brain health and how proactive and available you can be about it what would you say are like the top two or three tips right away you want people to implement once they listen to this in regards to their brain health or just takeaway messages Yes, thank you, Carrie. Well, I think the first thing is food. So we have to get serious about your primary way to nourish your brain, which is what you eat. So you're in this life and at this moment you have one brain. It's not like a kidney. There's no brain transplant av available. We want to make at least 80% of our meals whole food based, which means that we need to learn or relearn how to cook. So that's the, that's the biggest thing, I think, food wise. I think sleep. So another point is sleep. So we know that sleep is not an inactive passive process. It's one of the most active times for your brain. It's where the brain detoxifies the beta amyloid plaques that might be contributing to Alzheimer's and that does it during deep sleep. So really I talk about, we talk about here in our clinic too, sleep restoration is brain rejuvenation. So we want to aim for seven or eight hours per night of sleep. Got my R ring on. So trying to get, you know, better about that myself. That's my weak point is sleep. So at least we want two of those hours before midnight to promote detoxification of that beta amyloid plaque. So um, I think Ben Franklin was right with that early to bed, early to rise makes a person healthy, wealthy, and wise or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course the, the best wealth is health. So I think we could just say makes them healthy, you know, everything else can, we can modify right. for this, um, this time as everything is changing that way. And then mindfulness is number three. I think breath work and mindfulness, essentially paying attention to your life. I mean, who wants to be a zombie throughout their life, right? So if we have a healthy brain, then ideally we can uh, kind of go through life alert and uh, focused and in the present moment rather in the present moment rather than being a zombie. 
Um, so really, uh, back to that BD, BDNF comment, breath work is or organic fertilizer for your brain. Mm -hmm. And so ideally start a mindfulness practice that you can incorporate into a breath work practice or a yoga practice or an exercise routine. So you can, you can incorporate into other things and you can get multiple synergistic benefits, which will make your brain more resilient throughout your life, day in and day out against those habits that we build, you know, upon itself. It's kind of like Lego building blocks, you know, in a way. And, and they, they kind of add up and then that'll, that'll have a good, a good payoff at the end. So, you know, committing to a mind-body practice 10 minutes once a day or twice a day. But even if it starts with one minute, just start with six breaths, you know. Um, studies actually show that if you do six, six breaths, which is about, I timed it before because I've, I've actually had that time and see, oh, what, how little can I meditate in order to get some benefit? <laughs> so, so 90 seconds is all it takes in theory to balance your nervous system out. Of course, more is better in a way, but at least you're getting something from that. So everyone has 90 minutes, even for, uh, you know, our constipated Seconds. patients. Yeah, you're, you have constipation, do meditation right there. So mindfulness, I'd say food, sleep and mindfulness are three of the big um, buckets in terms of optimizing brain health. I love it. I love it. This has been fantastic. Tell everyone where they can learn more from you, where they can see your clinic, all the things. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, first of all, big shout out to you and all the work you do. And thank you so much for coming on to our podcast, which uh, I will say is Capital Integrative Health Podcast. So that's also the name of our clinic, which is in Bethesda, Maryland, right, out of stud, right outside of D.C., kind of the suburbs of D.C. Um, we have a website that is www.cihealth.org. And we have Instagram and Facebook pages, which are managed by our wonderful director of marketing, Jen. So a little shout out to Jen here. And you can go to Instagram, Capital Integrative Health, or Facebook. And just a shout out to all our entire amazing team at CIH, Capital Integrative Health. Much love to them and um, much love to all your listeners. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. And I have known, I've been working with Capital Integrative Health for a long time. So I know and gotten to become friends with and adore so many of your practitioners. So I am just so glad to have you on here, but also to be able to be associated um, with Capital Integrative Health. So thank you. We're going to make you a tiara, like I said before. Yeah. A, um, honor, honorary An honorary. Tiara. I yes, love it. Yes. <laughs> I'll Thank take you, it. Carrie.